Okay, so welcome to this next video in which we are discussing angiogenesis in chronic inflammation. Okay, so we are discussing the final of the three pathways which these receptor tyrosine kinases are going to activate. Okay, so this is going to be the PI3 kinase AKT mTOR pathway. Right, so what happens is we have these phosphotyrosine residues on the intracellular aspect of our receptor tyrosine kinase. And what's going to happen is they are going to recruit the phosphoinositol, uh, sorry, phosphatidylinositol free kinase enzyme. So this is an enzyme that's usually within the cytoplasm of the cell. And just like phospholipase C gamma, which when the phosphotyrosine residues were exposed, came to the membrane associated with those phosphotyrosine residues and then acted on the, the phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate in the membrane, PI3 kinase is going to do a similar thing. The phosphotyrosine residues serve as a way of recruiting the PI3 kinase to the membrane, i.e. Bring it, bringing it up here and sticking it there so that it can then act on the components of the membrane, which again is actually going to be phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. So, when you have these phosphotyrosine residues on your intracellular domain, that serves to recruit the PI3 kinase from the cytoplasm and it now sticks onto these phosphotyrosine residues and then is held at the uh, membrane and will now work on the membrane basically. So really the phosphotyrosine residues don't actually activate the enzyme, all they do is localize it at the plasma membrane. Okay, so what's it going to do once it's now at the plasma membrane? Well, again, it's going to work on PIP2, but it's going to do a different thing to it uh, uh, than, um, well, compared to um, phospholipase C gamma. So it's not going to do the same thing. So let's draw out our molecule of PIP2 again. So remember, it's phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate. So here is the inositol ring with the phosphate groups of the fourth and fifth carbons here. Let's colour everything in. So in green we have the glycerol there, okay. In orange we have the fatty acid tails. In purple we have the phosphate groups, okay. So one here, one here, one here. And then we'll have the inositol ring in blue. Okay, now basically this enzyme is a kinase enzyme. It's going to add a phosphate group onto this molecule, and it's going to add it onto the third carbon of the inositol ring. So what it's going to do is convert phosphatidyl inositol 4,5-bisphosphate, PIP2, into phosphatidyl inositol. However, it's now got three phosphate groups coming off that inositol ring. Well, actually, it's got four if you count this one up here. Okay. It's got one coming off this third carbon here, one coming off the fourth carbon, and one coming off the fifth carbon. So this molecule is often abbreviated as PIP3, phosphatidylinositol, and then we've got three phosphate groups, so we need to put P3 there. So let's colour it in again. So here is the inositol ring again. Here is the phosphate groups coming off the inositol ring, one, two, three, four. Okay, here is the glycerol molecule in green here, and here is the fatty acids that are esterified still to the glycerol molecule and are holding the whole thing in the phospholipid bilayer. Okay, now the full name for this molecule is phosphatidyl inositol, four, well, 345 this phosphate now. So phosphatidyl inositol. So that makes sense because we've got this phosphatidyl group here, then we've got inositol, and now it's 3, 4, 5 trisphosphate. And again, that makes sense because now it's just listing off where the phosphate groups are sticking off the phosphatidyl inositol molecule. We've got one phosphate group coming off this third carbon, one coming off the fourth carbon, and one coming off the fifth carbon. So this is phosphatidyl inositol 345 trisphosphate. 
Okay, so what's going to happen is when you activate this receptor tyrosine kinase and activate the uh, localization of the phosphatidylinositol free kinase enzyme at the membrane, it's going to convert phosphatidylinositol 4,5-bisphosphate into phosphatidylinositol 3,4,5-trisphosphate or PIP3. And this is not a normal component of the membrane. And the reason it's not a normal component of the, en uh, of the membrane is that there is an enzyme which is in the membrane which breaks uh, the phosphate group off the um, third carbon of the inositol ring. So let me try and complete the membrane here. So here's our phospholipid by there. So within the phospholipid by there, you have an enzyme known as P10, okay? And the job of this enzyme is to go around in the membrane and look for PIP3 molecules. And when, when it finds PIP3 molecules, it chops off this phosphate group that is on the third carbon of the inositol ring, and therefore returns PIP3 molecules into PIP2 molecules. Okay, so that's the reason you don't usually have any PIP3 molecules in the membrane, because they're all being broken down into PIP2 by this uh, P10 enzyme. Okay, so what will happen when we activate our receptor tyrosine kinase is that temporarily you'll start getting PIP3 being formed, and then before the P10 can uh, act on the PIP3 and break it down, you'll temporarily get a PIP3 signal. Okay, and this PIP3 that's temporarily in the membrane is going to lead to downstream signaling pathways. Okay, so what are these downstream signaling pathways? Well, basically, PIP3 is going to um, serve as an attachment molecule for two enzymes, basically. So, let me show this here now. So, we have now created PIP3 molecules on the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there, okay? So here we are. Here is a PIP3 molecule. And what's going to happen is that enzymes from the cytoplasm are going to be able to come and bind to these PIP3 molecules which are in the plasma membrane. Okay, so here's one. And one of these enzymes is going to come and bind to this head, basically, of the PIP3 molecule, which is sticking into uh, the uh, cytoplasm of the cell. Okay, so here is the phospholipid by there, continuing on. And the name of this enzyme is the phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1 enzyme. Okay, so let me put this down here. So, um, this is the phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1. So let me bring this up a little bit. Okay, so phosphoinositide dependent kinase. Okay, and phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1 is often abbreviated to PDK1. Dependent kinase 1. And again, there are different forms of phosphoinositide dependent kinase enzymes, but the most important form of phosphoinositide dependent kinase is PDK1. Okay, so we'll label this up as PDK1 for short. And we might even colour PDK1 in because it's so important. Oh, and we should colour in our phosphatidyl inositol 345 trisphosphate molecule as well. So here's our phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1 enzyme, our PDK1. Okay, and now let's colour in our PIP3 molecule. So, in blue here again is the inositol ring, which is the centre of this head, okay? And here are the phosphate groups coming off the inositol ring in vivid purple here, okay? And then lodging it or in the membrane, or, or holding it in the membrane, is this uh, glycerol, which has these two long-chain carboxylic acids which are anchoring it in the membrane. Now, Phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1 is usually within the cytoplasm, and in the cytoplasm it is inactive. 
However, when it comes and binds to the PIP3 in the membrane of the cell, it becomes activated. So in this case, it's not just a case of uh, it's being localized to the membrane and then its activity is going to be seen. Okay, so we saw for the enzymes phospholipase C gamma and PI3 kinase, they were both active all the time, but they had no substrate because they were in the cytoplasm. And then when they were localized to the membrane by these phosphotyrosine residues, which they bound to, they could then act on the PIP2 in the membrane. Well, it's not like that for phosphoinositide-dependent kinase 1. It's actually inactive when it's in the cytoplasm. And then when it is localized to the plasma membrane by binding to PIP3, it's then going to become activated. Okay, so this enzyme has gone to the membrane and it's now become activated. Now, what is it going to do? Well, it's a kinase enzyme, so it's going to stick phosphate groups onto things. Now, it's going to stick a phosphate group onto another very important enzyme. But we have to question, how is it going to get access to this very important enzyme? Because now, it's stuck at the inner leaflet of the phospholipid by there. So it's only going to be able to see things which are also stuck at the in the leaflet of the phospholipid by there. So this other enzyme that phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1 is going to act on is also going to be localized to the plasma membrane by binding to uh, PIP3 in the plasma membrane. Okay, so here is another molecule of phosphatidyl inositol uh, 345-trisphosphate. Okay, so let's color it in now. Here are the fatty acid molecules which are holding it in the phospholipid by there. And here is the glycerol molecule in green. Here is the phosphate group that attaches the glycerol to the inositol. And here are the three phosphate groups coming off the inositol ring. And here in blue is our six-membered inositol carbon ring. Okay, right. Now, um, another enzyme, basically, is going to come to the inner leaf that are the phospholipid by there from the cytoplasm and bind to these PIP3 molecules that we have now in the inner leaf that are the phospholipid by there. Okay, now this is a famous enzyme. Okay, so again, I'll draw it binding to the head of this phosphatidylinositol 345-trisphosphate. Okay, so this enzyme is protein kinase B. Okay, so very, very important enzyme. Protein kinase B, often abbreviated to PKB. However, if you read the research literature, you will not hear this enzyme referred to as protein kinase B. Students like to call it protein kinase B because they know protein kinase enzymes are important. We have protein kinase A, which is incredibly important in G protein coupled receptors. We have protein kinase C, also very important in uh, the GQ pathway this time, rather than the GS pathway for protein kinase A. Um, then we've got protein kinase G, which is very important in uh, smooth muscle cell relaxation in response to nitric oxide. So this one nicely fits in with the other protein kinases, it's a very important enzyme. However, its old name, which is often still used, is to um, give it the initials AKT. So certainly if you read the research literature, you will see this often referred to as AKT. And if they're being nice, they'll put slash protein kinase B. Okay, uh, but AKT is still very pervasive for uh, this enzyme to be described as. Okay, now the initials, the AKT initials, they stand for some um, niche little thing. They don't even stand for the names of the people who discovered it. They stand for like the way it was discovered or something along those lines. Okay, so we'll just know it as AKT. Right, so we'll colour in AKT or protein kinase B in turquoise here. Okay, and basically it's going to be localized to the plasma membrane as well by binding to this PIP3, which is transiently going to appear in the membrane after it's been created before the P10 enzyme has had the chance to actually break it down. Okay, so this is AKT or protein kinase B. Okay, right, so. 
protein kinase B, when it binds to the phosphatidylosetol 345 trisphosphate is not going to be activated. Okay, so it's different from phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1. It's not activated by the binding uh, to PIP3. Okay, instead it just localizes at the plasma membrane, and now it's a perfect target for this phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1 because they're now both at the uh, inner leaflet of the phospholipid bile there. So what's going to happen is that phosphoinositide dependent kinase 1 is going to stick a phosphate group, which I'll just show as a little purple ball, okay? It's going to stick a phosphate group onto the AKT slash protein kinase B enzyme, and that now is going to activate uh, the AKT or protein kinase B enzyme. And this enzyme now is going to carry out the reactions uh, that are going to lead to the activation of another transcription factor. And we'll continue this discussion and see how in the next video.